Okay. It's one minute past, past nine o'clock. Um, good morning, everybody, wherever you are. Thank you very much for joining into our Night Funk Africa uh, valuation webinar. And the discussion topic is going to be on um, liability capping and the rationale behind it. It's nine o'clock, so I'd like to get this show off the ground. And I will start by introducing our panelists. The biodata has already been shared um, on, on various social media platforms, but I will just give a brief introduction for, for those who didn't manage to catch it. Um, I will start with myself. My name is Judy Rugasira Kianda. I'm the Managing Director of Night Funk Uganda. We have been um, in existence over the last 22 years in Kampala, um, and I head up the valuations department. Um, I'm a chartered surveyor and also a registered surveyor in Uganda. Uh, Christine O'Rourke is the head of conduct standards um, for the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors, and she is charged with responsibility for the rules of conduct and other standards relating to professional conduct. She previously led the investigation and disciplinary teams in the RICS regulation and has a background in professional regulation and complaints handling, including roles at the professional regulators for teachers, psychologists and, and solicitors and the pensions ombudsman. Chrissy, you're very welcome. And, and thank you for accepting to be one of our panelists. Thanks, Judy. Mr. Dogo Singh Sherman is the head of Bank Assurance, Stanbic Bank Uganda. Dogo has 18 years of solid knowledge in various sectors with multinational companies, including financial services, insurance and logistics, among others. He has experience working with a large, diverse workforce of over 150 people, both directly and indirectly. His key strengths is in enterprise risk management, insurance, business management, PR and marketing, logistics, business development, project management, social enterprise, community development, to name but a few. Dogo, you're very welcome. And again, thank you for being one of our panelists. Mr. Stephen Macau. Thank you very much, Judy. Mr. Stephen Macau is a chartered surveyor and he heads up the valuation and advisory services with Night Frank Kenya. Stephen has 17 years experience and has worked with financial institutions, multinationals and international organizations, government bodies and many other private individuals. He has handled instructions related to financial reporting, secured lending, acquisitions and disposals, recoveries and joint ventures. Stephen is a registered valuer, a member of the RSCS, an institution of surveyors of Kenya, and a registered and licensed valuer with the Valuers Registration Board of Kenya. You're very welcome, Stephen. <clears throat> Last but not least is Mr. Babatope Fasun Loro, um, also a chartered surveyor with Knight Frank Nigeria. Babatope is a seasoned professional with 10 years of post qualification experience in property valuations, feasibility, viability appraisals and real estate market research. Babatope is a member of the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors, an associate member of the Nigerian Institution of Estate Surveyors and Valuers, and a registered estate surveyor and valuer of the Estate Surveyors and Valuers Registration Board of Nigeria. Thank you, Topi, and very welcome to this panel. You're welcome, Judy. So basically our topic this morning, ladies and gentlemen, is on liability capping. And before I go any further, I also want to thank you all very much for registering and logging into our discussion topic this morning, which I think is, is one that's very useful and one that has been um, sort of trending in many, in many um, sectors of the valuation fraternity within the financial institutions, the insurance companies, um, especially now that we are being faced with more and more challenging valuations um, in an environment that is full of uncertainty. Uh, I think professional indemnity insurance and liability capping is, is a topic that is certainly um, being discussed more and more frequently between valuers, their clients, and the, the lending institution. So we, we thought it useful and, and topical to be discussing this at such a time as this. And I'm happy to see the interest that has been taken through the registrations to join and listen to this webinar that is being um, hosted at the moment. So we will be discussing what liability caps are and what they do. Um, and I will not make the assumption that everybody knows 
in detail or everybody on in in the participants is is a valuer or understands what liability cappings are necessarily so i will and neither do i want to take away from chrissy um of the rics who will be giving us a detailed sort of explanation and background to what professional indemnity insurance and liability cappings are so i will hand over to you now chrissy um from the rics perspective to let us know what pi cover is what liability caps are and what you guide your members and registered firms um, and how you advise us to cap our liabilities. So over to you, Chrissy. Thanks, Judy. I'm just going to share my screen. So just bear with me for a second while I get some slides up. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for inviting me to, to speak to you. Um, as Judy mentioned, I am Head of Conduct Standards, so I'm not a valuer, but uh, the reason that I have knowledge in this area is because one of the uh, areas that I deal with is professional indemnity insurance, um, and I was involved in the drafting of the risk, liability and insurance guidance that I'm going to talk a little bit about, which um, is what advises our members that they should consider risk in their instructions um, and how they manage that risk uh, for both for them and for their clients. I'd like to start by saying that there are obviously a number of ways in which our ICS assures confidence in, uh, its for its clients and its stakeholders. The most important of which I would say are our qualification standards. So you'll obviously, I hope, know that in order to become um, either an associate or a MRICS uh, member of our ICS, there is a, a very stringent um, assessment process which takes place, which assesses people's competence to do the work, um, which they then go on to do. Um, that involves uh, some, some tests, some, some ethics tests, but also um, an interview process in which they're expected to demonstrate their competence through having worked in, in the area before they're able to become qualified members of our ICS. We also, as I'm sure or I hope many of you will know, um, publish a full suite of technical valuation standards, which we usually refer to as the Red Book. Um, those are internationally recognised. They also incorporate the international valuation standards. Um, and we do assure our members and our firms compliance with those through a risk-based series of, of visits, help, training, that sort of thing. So, we take very seriously the competence um, and the ability of our members to provide um, good uh, quality comfort, uh, good quality valuation services, which um, clients and stakeholders can have confidence in. What I would say, though, is that um, all of us can, from time to time, make a mistake, or there can be issues within a transaction or within a market which might cause claims to be made, and that's why we. Uh, insist that our valuers and our firms have professional indemnity cover. What that does is it ensures that if there is a loss which is caused um, from negligent services or advice, or there's a claim that such a loss may have been caused, um, there, is, uh, there is cover for those costs so that the firm, um, if it can't meet them out of its own resources, has some cover to ensure that clients and stakeholders aren't left out of, uh, out of pocket. So this is a really important part of protection, both for clients, um, but also for firms themselves, because of, obviously, if firms weren't able to meet the costs of potential claims, they would go out of business, there would be a lack of competition within the marketplace, and there would be a lack of competition for providers of, of valuation services to clients. So it's in the best interest of clients as well that we have um, thriving firms who are able to afford their professional indemnity insurance. Um, I'm sure many of you will know that um, certainly in the UK and, and, and I think across the world, the last few years have shown a real hardening of the professional indemnity insurance market. I know Doggo is going to talk a little bit more about what professional indemnity insurance does. Um, but for us, it's been particularly important that our firms consider how they can continue to insure um, and afford uh, professional indemnity cover, which is required by our rules of conduct for both firms and valuers. 
And this really is why we recommend liability caps to our members. It is obviously very important that those liability caps are used where they're legally permissible. Um, what I would say is obviously I'm not a, a legal expert in the, the legal systems in each of your countries. Um, our guidance is written from uh, a UK law perspective, but I understand that many of you have common law jurisdictions, so a lot of the principles will be similar. Um, but there will obviously the principle itself of thinking about risk, thinking about how you what claims might arise and how you might cover them is important, whatever legal system that you're working within. Um, a liability cap is a contractual agreement. So it's an agreement between a firm and its particular client about what loss could be claimed in a particular um, transaction or aggregate series of transactions, even if the law would otherwise award a greater sum in damages. So you'll all be aware that, um, you know, that there's a lot of, of case law around what could be claimed, um, what could be awarded in damages. I'm sure many of you will be aware of the SAMCO cap, um, which limits the, the liability of valuers in itself in most circumstances to the difference between um, the valuation that was given and the valuation that the court decides would have been correct at the date of the valuation. Um, but even then, that's obviously case law. It's open to challenge. A firm can't know at the point at which it's giving the advice what a court may later decide, because of course a firm is not going to set out to give negligent advice. So it is important that a firm is able to think about what losses might arise from uh, this instruction and have a commercial conversation with a client about what risk and liability it, that firm agrees to take on, um, what's a fair allocation of risk and reward between members and their clients. We, as I say, we publish a guidance note on this. It's available on our website. Um, if you go onto our website and look at upholding professional standards, um, there's a drop down menu there which will take you to it. There's a link in this presentation as well. Um, and if you Google RICS risk liability and insurance, you'll find it also. Um, that sets out um, a lot of information about the principles of good practice around risk management generally, not just liability caps, but some of the other ways that you can think as a firm and as a client about um, what kind of risks you're taking on, what might you expect to see in a firm's terms of engagement. Um, so thinking about things like um, proportionate liability in transactions in which there may be a number of professionals involved. Um, but also we very strongly advise our firms to um, uh, not to allow third party reliance, except in circumstances where that's properly set out in the contract so that, that the firm is protected against third parties in the same way as it is for its own clients. We give an example wording in the guidance note. Um, obviously, we would expect you know, firms to take their own legal advice on their own uh, legal system that they're working within. Um, but as you say, it does say that we recommend the use of liability caps as a way to manage risk in professional work. Um, and it goes on to suggest that, that firms um, limit their liability in relation to negligence, breach of contract, and other cause, um, except for obviously fraud, um, and then give an amount. We don't set an amount. Um, it's very important to say that this is not intended to be anti-competitive. Um, it's a matter for negotiation of what is reasonable in the particular circumstances in which the, this negotiation is happening. So looking at the particular transaction or, or um, uh, work that is in contemplation. Um, we set out a number of key factors in our guidance, and those are the factors that uh, courts in our experience use to think about what is reasonable in deciding whether um, a liability cap is enforceable. So thinking about the level of risk, um, what's the scope of the work? What's the purpose of the instruction? Obviously some purposes are riskier than others. Some types of lending are riskier than others, for example. Um, what's the time available for doing the work? You know, is, are you being asked to do a job urgently? That might increase the risk. Um, 
and the complexity of the instructions and who the parties that might rely on on the work as well. So are you dealing with a single lender or a number of lenders? What kind of lending are you looking at? For example, those are all factors. Thinking about the level of fees, as I said earlier, what we are suggesting to our firms that they do is trying to balance the risk and reward and find a fair, um, a fair level of those between themselves and the client. So generally, it's not reasonable to um, seek to set a cap that's below the level of the fee for obvious reasons. Um, but it does have to be, what we do suggest is that the, the cap should be sort of proportionate to the reward that the, the firm is getting. Um, think about what limit your professional indemnity insurance policy is. Obviously, those two things aren't necessarily connected in the sense that the liability cap doesn't have to be anywhere close to what the limit of the professional indemnity insurance policy is. We would generally suggest that firms don't set a liability cap that's over that limit, um, but any liability cap is better than none, um, we would suggest. But also, as I said earlier, think about the cost of the firm of getting um, indemnity insurance, because what we're trying to do is ensure that firms can be sustainable long term. So, um, you know, if, if you think about the level of risk that you're taking on, the level of insurance that you therefore need to have, um, that is going to affect uh, the long term sustainability of, of the firm and they need to consider that to stay in business. Obviously, the firm and the client need to think about what could be the losses here. So what is the value of the property? Um, what kind of lending decision is being made? Because again, what we're looking for is an equitable uh, division of, of that risk um, between the, the firm and the, the client. Obviously, if it's a very risky transaction for, uh, for the lender, you might want to think about that in terms of um, a liability cap. Obviously, you think about the bargaining position of the parties. You know, if you're dealing with a, um, a, a commercial client, maybe a large lender, a lender with its own risk assessment um, policies and professionals, you know, they are in a much stronger position to agree a liability cap, which is likely to be enforceable than if you're dealing with a consumer, a member of the public. And it's also important, of course, that the cap is brought clearly to the client's attention. Um, this is not something that gets buried in small print. This is very much a commercial negotiation which should be had up front so everybody is aware um, of what is being agreed. So that, I hope, is a, it's a, a short but I hope helpful um, introduction to what liability caps are, why we recommend them, and the things that we, uh, that we say firms and their clients should take into account in deciding uh, if they're going to um, if they're going to include one in their contract, it's back to you, Judy. Thank you very much for that, Chrissy. Um, I think that really was quite detailed, precise, and to the point, and it clearly sets out the rationale behind why the RICS um, guides its members um, and, and registered firms to consider liability capping. Uh, and hopefully it will help lead on to um, <clears throat> Dogo's presentation. And Dogo is going to, to speak to us from a banker's perspective and a financial institution or lending institution's perspective um, as to how they view uh, PI um, insurance and, and a little bit on capping as well. Over to you, Dogo. Thank you. Uh, can I give you one minute if I try to? So, um, well, good morning, and thank you very much for having me here today. I think my role is clear. I'm going to talk from a perspective of the financial institution, and then I'll break it down to sort of uh, a clear elaboration of the professional indemnity cover that uh, most financial institutions uh, would like to have. And then maybe we can have a QA and elaborate. So, I wanted to give very clear uh, sort of four pointers. When you're working with a financial institution, what are the four things that you look out for when we need your services as, a, as an assessor or a valuer? The first one is definitely the brand value. So when I talk about brand value, we're looking at the vintage or the number of years you've been um, There are people who are relatively 
the business, but they are people who are who have been in the business, and this gives them an edge over the others. Recommendations or references or other works that you've ever done before, and also association with those particular works. So if you've done a bit of a complex financial uh, evaluation, it gives you an edge uh, compared to the others, and it enables the brand to be valued uh, when we are making the assessment. The other one is international presence. I think this one is more of um, you have other offices are you um, connected to any international uh, sort of value that may it actually impact that soft power of soft local team. The other most important thing is the mature markets. Have you operated in the mature market? So there are people uh, or value who have been in other markets and what that means is because we know mature markets have better practice, it also enables us to get that confidence that your brand is well placed. The last one in terms of the brand value is the ISO uh, certification. So many of you, it's important to sort of have your you know, sort of your processes and procedures of get ISO certified to enable and give the comfort to the bank in terms of the second piece, which is very most important definitely the strong management structure. And this, I've clustered it into two categories. The first one is leadership management. So it is very important for you to demonstrate to the bank that you have a leadership team that is strong, uh, they can make decisions, uh, the management team will uh, uh, The second one is definitely sound policies and procedures. It's important, like I said, policy because then it, it demonstrates your understanding of business and where you find issues to be easily, easily be able to sort it out and correct it. The other thing is the control environment. This is the checks and balances. You need to ensure that you keep on auditing and checking to enable it to function properly. The third one is definitely qualification and and um, I'm just going to say this I I'm in a different department. I'm the head of insurance. But there is a gentleman who's like a brand in the back. It's called Arafat. Everyone knows him as a value uh, or an assessor in the, in the bank. I know him. I know his name. And it's uh, simply because of the qualification and the experience that uh, he brings to the field. So we also look at that as a key component before giving uh, of, of The fourth thing is definitely the correct PI cover for your risk. So you may actually ask, is it only PI? No, I've mentioned that three on top. PI comes with comfort, both to the financial institution and also yourself, that just in case you can have a So I'm going to play for you a small video just to sort of give you clarity on the PI, and then I'll talk in the specific about PI, and then you can go into the Q&A. Dogo, are we meant to be having sound with this? Sorry? Is it meant to be having sound? Yes, it's supposed to have sound. There is no sound coming out. There is no sound. OK, so maybe for technicality, let me just uh, jump uh, this particular video. And I talk into the presentation. It covers the same. So um, the purpose of the PI is basically to protect the professional yourself as a valuer 
to ensure that in any case, get any legal action, at least uh, the financial law arising uh, negligence, your employer's negligence be covered. And usually we offer only to professionals, we don't offer it to any other, um, uh, let's say pastime or casual workers. We specifically offer to valuers, surveyors, doctors, people who are professional. The common terms that you may actually see in the policy, there are things like excess. Well, excess is the first amount payable by you in the event of a loss. If you get a loss, the bank expects that, uh, and the insurance expects that you take a bit of uh, the portion of that loss when you submit a claim. The second piece is the limit of liability. Uh, I think Christina has also mentioned this. So when you're negotiating, you need to actually understand that you have a particular limit of liability. And in case you have a loss, that limit of liability is able to cover your exposure. The other next important thing, so what are the, uh, the, the key things that are covered in that particular policy? Uh, negligence or breach of duty of care. So there are four things, I mean three things. Um, a project through negligence, uh, uh, you know, maybe during survey, valuation and allegations that you have actually, uh, you have not upheld your professional standards. And this we've seen in the industry of late whereby the, the valuers either don't manage the information properly or they are a bit negligent in terms of actually handling the client's uh, issues. And then it arises uh, or maybe claims that you need to actually pay. Infringement of intellectual property rights. And I must talk about, I know of a case whereby an architect decided to use uh, somebody else's uh, intellectual property. And uh, there is actually a case in court right now as we speak. So it's very important to always, always not uh, get caught, but the thing the cover provides uh, um, provides security in terms of uh, intellectual property. The other thing is a uh, breach of confidence. Uh, if sharing confidential or sensitive information, it may not be you, but remember you're working with staff members who can easily share some confidential information about the client. And this can actually be defamation, making false or damaging claims about a person or an organization, for instance, uh, maybe your, your, your staff member or yourself may say something that is very defamatory and it's very social. And if you know it, it becomes a uh, errors and omissions. We uh, more of a human uh, mistake, maybe during the contracting or evaluation, you make a mistake, the cover actually provides provision. So what are the basis uh, of uh, computing this premium and ensuring that we cover your access? Look, definitely um, claims can arise from surveyors or valuation made of property even in connection with a sale or purchase. We've seen cases whereby um, we, we look at the actual property value and the liability can arise from common law, statute and uh, under contract. As you know, common law, maybe just to give clarity, Common law derived from custom or judicial uh, precedent and not the statute. So common law affects a certain group of people or a market. And usually they use this uh, to ensure that you're covered with that particular or statute or even under contract. So premiums are best. So if you ask yourself how will the premium be computed, it's definitely the size of the farm or the income. For instance, if you're doing a business for 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 standing. Standing may actually require you to get a certain liability limit. Type of work being undertaken, you know the, the complexity of that work, you need to make sure that um, they will use this as a, as, as a means to compute your Do you have other claims uh, you've ever incurred in the past? It also determines, it shows the behavior. Number of qualified partners, it also enables the claims to be lowered or increased if you have qualified. Um, partners or directors in the company shows that they are mature people. Experience, and I've talked about this earlier on, it does matter a lot and it also helps to ensure that the company can reach you. Then the limit of liability required. Sometimes, if you want a lower limit of liability, they will charge you less. If you want a higher limit of liability, they will also charge you less. So, exclusion, and I think this is the last. So, usually, I tell, we advise our clients that when you're picking that policy, from an insurance company, don't make an assumption that it covers you 100%. Very important for you to look 
straight into the exclusion of that particular policy. Because what, what is not included is excluded. So it's important for you to sort of look at this. For instance, I've just picked some of the exclusions, theft, damage by employees. So if your staff members, um, uh, you know, they are in, uh, they do, uh, maybe they've done something uh, in relation to, uh, to, contrary to the law, it could be excluded, maybe for it steal some information or do something that is contrary to the law. Service rendered while well under the influence. So if you are uh, either intoxicated, you drugs, alcohol, and advising the client, uh, losses, if you have prior losses, including legal acts. These are criminal money laundering. If you, let's say, for instance, participate in money laundering, it will also be excluded. The policy will not be able to cover you. Um, we have fines, penalty, punitive, or uh, exemplary damages. So there are some fines that maybe um, uh, that, are, that has actually accrued to your, to, your, to your institution. Let's say, for instance, you're not paying your taxes. You can actually not enjoy the policy because we need to show your profession. Then bodily injury, these are some of the things that are excluded. So for instance, if somebody gets injured during the engagement, there's a different policy for that, and it's covered by the design. So I think, Judy, I submit that is my submission. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dago. That was really interesting. Shame we couldn't have the sound on the um, <clears throat> on the video, but I'm sure we can get that later and hopefully share it with um, with a list of participants. That's that's really exciting. I'm I'm happy to have gotten the background from Chrissy, who's who's put context to why the RICS advises its members to cap their liability. Um, and it's good that it, it is not something that valuers have just come up with, or it is not a way of us trying to, shall I say, um, push back on liability, but it is best practice that we cap our liability. And, and that is the single reason really why we do it. Um, and as Chrissy has said, as long as it's reasonable um, and, and it's not anti-competitive, um, then it, it is very okay and acceptable for us to do that. However, that said, from the financial institution perspective, Dogo, um, and I speak because we are in 12 markets, Knight Frank is in, in 12 markets, but we cover nearly 42 or, or 50, nearly 42 to 50 markets in Africa. We do valuations across the region. And we have interfaced and interacted with a lot of financial institutions. And it is in our interest as, as registered firms of the RICS to cap our liability. And we're having these discussions with the financial institutions and finding huge pushback from the financial institutions when it comes to explaining why we need to cap our liability and trying to make them understand that it is best practice. I'm going to give my colleagues, Stephen and, and Topi, an opportunity to tell us what challenges are you facing, Stephen, in Kenya and, and um, Babatopi in Nigeria? Why are we having such a challenge trying to make the, the lending institutions and other business clients understand that it is good practice for us to cap our liability and it has nothing to do with us shunning our responsibility as professionals or as valuers who are going to give a good service. Could you just shed some light on some of these challenges that you're facing, please? Stephen, we'll start with you. Thank you, Didi. Um, I agree with you that um, in this part of Africa, we have had a challenge with financial institutions, particularly when we are having discussions around liability capping. Um, and for me, uh, for my understanding is that um, the reason why we are having a pushback is because largely it's a, it's a, it's a new concept. Um, and this being an asset market that is still growing, perhaps there is a misconception or misunderstanding between what PI entails and what liability capping entails. Mm -hmm. And we, 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 I, do, I do believe one of the reasons why we, we, we get that push, pushback is because of that confusion between those two key parts, um, you know, of, of, of you know that we have to cover while doing uh, valuation work, because uh, it, it is new, um, you know, in our market. Banks don't seem to understand it. They also seem to uh, to confuse those two. Um, we, you know, there's also the notion that perhaps valuers are trying to 
negate their the provision on duty of care while conducting evaluations. Um, and, and so if, if a lot of, um, there's a lot of education that needs to be done uh, to make them understand that PI is just one of the elements that we consider while providing a, a very high you know, quality of service. There are many other things that we put in place and, and therefore, you know, uh, PI uh, liability capping has nothing to do with the ability to provide a high level of service. We are not negating our duty. Uh, we are trying to introduce an element of, um, of best practices. Um, and and it, it works for everyone's benefit because uh, what, what, what liability capping does, it, 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 it directs, basically it brings on board um, fairness while allocating risk between the valuer uh, and the bank. There's also a lot of transparency in the sense that the valuer knows the level of exposure and the bank too. Uh, and I think that must feed into the overall uh, loan risk assessment. Uh, when these things are very clear, there's transparency, there's clarity, it works to, to everyone's uh, benefit. And of course, um, we, 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 with fairness, we, we, you want to see the value in the market tomorrow and the day after. Um, and, and, and that, you know, that keeps competition present, which is healthy. Um, and, and basically the reason why there is that resistance, in my opinion, is because it is largely new, misunderstood. Uh, but there is progress. Um, and I think continually we will get there. Thank you, Judy. Thank you very much, Stephen. I think Dogo made that very clear when he was talking about, you know, what financial institutions need from an assessor or a valuer, and it's not just your PI cover because anybody can acquire, you know, the required the requisite PI cover. But does that necessarily mean that you you are going to provide, you know, the level of service that is expected of a professional valuer? Um, and I think that's that that's a point that we will probably be looking at a little later. Uh, Toby, can I hear from you, please, uh, regarding your experiences in Nigeria? Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so concerning the challenges for uh, securing PI covers and having your liabilities cap in valuation, right? It's a similar experience across Africa, right? Um, and I'll, I'll zoom equally beyond, you know, the shores of Africa where um, bankers most especially do not want to, you know, um, have that capping around it. So um, it's left loose ended. So and this is not a fair contract, right? You will agree with me. Uh, oftentimes when you, you know, when you engage and you have this discussion of having your liability cap, there's always a push, a pushback, right? And it's expected because um, ideally everybody wants to, you know, do what is, you know, what, what favors them, you know, and, um, and that is not best practice, right? As Judy has rightly said, it's very important that we are having this discussion, right? And um, you know, I would say it's one of its first of its kind in this region, right? And it's going to set a tone. I, I, I don't expect anything less than that to happen. Um, you know, Stephen has said something about awareness and we can't, you know, we can't argue that, we can't over argue the fact that many people don't understand, you know, the rationale that, you know, that lies behind um, capping liabilities for valuation and things like that. So. When, when you tell someone, oh, you know, you want to cap your liabilities, it's, it sounds like, oh, you don't want to take um, responsibility for losses, you know, but uh, that's absolutely not correct. Why? Because um, you, you, you don't want to look at the, you know, the litigation cases that, um, that can follow a situation whereby um, a damage has occurred, the loss has occurred, and um, both parties have to, you know, seek seek claims, you know, for the damage that has happened. In such a situation, um, I, would, I would just give a case in point of, you know, to say you, you've been hacked, right, to go and provide for a loss that has occurred in a transaction. And we even discovered that the individual, the firm in question, right, was a cover of maybe, let's say, it's, it, a two million era of a local currency, right, um, is not sufficient to cover that loss, right? and decisions could be taken as to using, you know, personal earnings and some other things, you know, to settle or to offset that loss. What if the individual is not even up to, right? Um, so let's give a case in point that the individual is not even up to, you know, is not valued enough to be able to offset that loss. So for, so for me, I, I think um, when we talk about capping liabilities, is a win-win on both sides. And we have to start looking at it from that direction. 
until that becomes the discussion, right? Um, it, we can then say we are probably a step, less than a step to our final destination because um, having your liability cap, right, is good for the valuer, is equally good, you know, for the clients. Um, you, 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 a loss of calls, and then probably we, we can put that to a relatively you know, small figure, right? Or to a huge amount of money, knowing fully well that real estate are capital intensive projects and um, a bad advice could, you know, could cost a company to go bankrupt. So in such a situation, you are shifting your, you are shifting your, 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 your loss, you know, the risk exposure in that transaction to an insurance company. You know, so for, for the, for, so I would say for, for the estate business, right? It safeguards the life of his business to continue, you know, and not affected by such exposure. And on the side of the clients who has decided to, you know, make this provision, what he has simply done is, if paraventure the, the surveyor or the valuer in question, you know, cannot offset the loss that has happened, there is an insurance provision to, you know, to take care of that. So I think uh, from my own opinion that it's a discussion that we need to see as best practice then we need to take a step further to see it as a win-win for both parties. Um, until, we, you know, until we decide to see it in that way, you know, um, we may not achieve so much. You know? It's a contract. So I, would, I would equally want to touch on that also, that um, when we talk about capping liabilities, oftentimes it comes with your terms of business, right? For a particular valuation instruction, which often you put as a clause to what liability, what liability capping you know, you'll be able to you know, to pledge for a situation whereby, you know, you fail in your duty of care. So in such a situation, in such a situation, it follows into your business, into your terms of business, right? And what that simply means is in a situation where anything goes wrong, there is something to fall back to, right? So that's, so for me, I, I think we need to have the discussion, you know, from the angle of a negotiation. Similarly, as we negotiate our fees, when jobs are going to be given, negotiating a liability cap is as important as that. You know, um, the focus is always on the commercial terms as to what as to what happens. But I think uh, the liability capping is equally a very you know a strong part, if you permit me to say, of your commercial terms also. You know, uh, so we can if you can have this conversation and have it sustained by all stakeholders. I think we will go a long way to deepen you know. Public uh, protecting the public interest and um, equally achieving what RICS is there for, you know, to ensure best practices and professional competences from its um, valuers. So that's just my comments, Judy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Topi. Um, then I, I have another uh, couple of questions. One goes to Chrissy uh, with regards to third party reliance. In the disclosures, we usually um, state that the report is only for the purpose of the intended end user. I'm not in those exact terms, but basically I am writing this report for the client who I have a contract with. But as you've said, there, there can be third party reliance. Um, if we have no contract with them, are we safe, so to speak, with regards to our liability cap or would that be assumed to be unreasonable? Um, I'm going to preface this by saying that I'm not qualified to give legal advice on that, but um, certainly if you, it's one of the reasons why we suggest that you're very careful about allowing third party reliance, because if you allow it, or if the courts um, find that you have assumed a duty of care towards somebody, and you haven't taken the steps in your communications with them to uh, to ensure that they're covered by the same liability cap and other contractual terms that you have with your client, then none of those will apply. In effect, if you have allowed third party reliance without communicating to that third party that they are bound by the same terms as your client was um, or is, then a court may find that they're not bound by those terms. So in effect, you may have taken on unlimited liability towards them. It's why we always suggest that firms are incredibly careful before they agree to any request for third party reliance. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, and then just a quick one coupled on with that. When, when we said um, the guidelines state that the liability cap or negligence can be 
uh, brought against a valuer for previous and current valuations. How far back do we go with the statutes of limitations? Is that uh, six years in, in most markets? It's here? a very complicated question in the UK. I, I don't know about your markets, but certainly in the UK, it's generally six years, but there's a long stop of 15 years for some other sorts of losses. Um, and the it, and if it's a contract that's a deed, it can be 12 years. So, I mean, six years is, is often a rule of thumb, I think, in a lot of markets, but it's something that I'd suggest that you really carefully take legal advice on what the statute of limitations is in, in your own uh, market or the market that you're that you've applied, uh, the, the legal um, system that you've applied in your contract. Thank you very much, Chrissy. Doggo, um, as you know, in, in many of our African markets that we operate in, um, and where you may have, Standic may have presence, uh, valuers are often required to partner with land surveyors and or plant and, and machinery engineers. And although they're not requested to submit their indemnity insurance papers, et cetera, do you, don't you think it's it's good practice moving on for all the professionals or the consultants who come on board to be required to also submit their professional indemnity insurance to the bank as opposed to having an umbrella cover through the valuer? Wouldn't this be one way of ensuring sustainability for the valuation firms so that then they're, they're not carrying the risk or being forced to carry the risk of the other um, consultants and, and subcontracted surveyors? Well, it's a good suggestion. I think uh, the unfortunate third party risk management process. I think, uh, let's say we, we stand to track a particular assessor or a valuer, they believe that your system, that structure will be able to sort of um, vet, evaluate, and check some of these things. As a bank, we also don't want to deal with multiple uh, people at the same time to just do a couple of deals. So they usually prefer to sort of funnel the business to ensure that they mitigate, limit the risk exposure, most especially when it comes to third party management uh, in terms of risk. Yes, it's a good suggestion, like you said, but I think the most important thing is the prudence approach on decision making, especially in the financial uh, service. Um, like Stanley, we also understand that different markets have different uh, risks. So therefore, we adapt one methodology across uh, the continent. It therefore exposes the bank somehow in a, in a bad place. The other thing that um, I must say is uh, we also approach the, the engagements fairly because we evaluate case by case and we look at how we are holding some of these uh, valuables on board by checking some of the things that I mentioned earlier on. So we just don't, um, um, we don't have like a very sort of, sort of definitive structure on how all the other markets in Africa should actually approach this, depending on the different risk Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Dago. Stephen, uh, what do you think financial institutions can do to minimize our risk as we provide our services? Because Dogo, financial institutions are also becoming a risk to us as valuers in, in many ways. So I think we're going to start taking out, like asking you to issue us with um, indemnity insurance as well. <laughs> so Stephen, can you just, and, and you know, and, and Topi after that, can you shed some light on what you think or how you feel the banks can de-risk our services? Uh, thank you, Judy. I think if, if you ask me, um, by the time a bank, uh, you know, does issue a loan, there, there are a lot of inputs that goes into consideration. Uh, and one of the things that the bank would do is to try and um, separate these issues so that the valuer is left to deal with what uh, squarely lies with valuation work. Um, and we, if, if you look in our market, some of the requests that um, Bank, banks ask us to do, in my opinion, could easily lie outside the scope of a value. Um, we have had instances where valuers are expected to comment on title issues. Um, and we can only do so much uh, in terms of uh, tenure issues and DD of related issues, uh, you know, um, are, are related. So, so one of the things that I think banks need to do is to make sure that the instructions that are issued to valuers are very clear as to what 
uh, the deliverables. And towards the diversity of a value are um, within evaluation instruction. Um, this is unique to Kenya, perhaps where you, you've seen mortgages, um, applications, and when the value goes to inspect the property, you are expected to confirm whether uh, it's a matrimonial property or not. You know, um, and frankly speaking, what does a value have to do with that? Uh, number two, you 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 are expected to to comment on issues to do with repair and sub. I am not a surveyor. So there's a lot of loss that can emanate from a loan that has gone south. But it has gone south not because the value does not do its work, but you're asking him to do things that are outside his scope and competence. And, and we, we, we need that clarity. Number two, um, I, I, I think the loan amount is really a discussion that the value is hardly involved. And the ability of a client or a borrower to repay the loan is also a discussion where the value is least um, um, involved. Um, well, we, are, we operate also in a market which is very uh, challenging in terms of availability of market evidence. And sometimes a bank would want to lend against a property, which we think it is very difficult to value, not because we are not competent, but because the market is what it is. Uh, you know, market evidence in terms of transactions are few and far in between, and it makes it very difficult for you to sort of gauge where the market is and how much that property will sell at. And it's not a value as problem, it is a market problem. Um, you'll be surprised that if, if, if in a typical market, and, 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 and I could be wrong, but I would imagine that uh, the level of confidence that a bank would attribute to a such evaluation report where it's a property that early traded, and another piece of property which is early, which is you know traded frequently and there's a lot of market evidence in terms of the way the bank treats those two valuations perhaps it's the same but you know from evaluation point of view they need to understand that i've given you evaluation but you need to attach less confidence on this asset because of the uniqueness of the asset and uniqueness of the market as opposed to another and i would prefer that banks separate some of these issues and do much more and they get the value much more as they are loan, as, as they assess the suitability of the property and also the amount of loan amount. So that is not about the quantitative and device, but also include a lot of qualitative and device, which um, sadly banks tend to, to, to ignore or rather not to pay a lot of regard to in their own assessment. Thank you. Thank you. Dogo, would you do you want to respond to that? <laughs> yeah, I think that's <laughs> it. So maybe I'll just say this. I think many banks, before they actually do the work, what we call terms of reference. And when you say the scope is not defined, then you need to actually ask because it is your duty as a professional uh, person to actually request for it. In most cases, if the bank does not de define the terms of reference, then you work out of scope. And I understand what you're saying, that the bank should always know what to give you. But you see, the bank would also want to spend little uh, in terms of the money they spend uh, in terms of uh, valuation as compared to what uh, they're, they're willing to pay out. So you need to always request for terms of reference and these terms of reference then it creates a scope where you'll be able to, to, to go and maybe do the valuation and come back. And if anything is requested, is out of scope, then it is not your mistake because the definition comes from terms of reference. But if you don't have the terms of reference and you've just taken the, the, the order or say, and you go and do a generic work, definitely then we'll have issues uh, when it comes to defining the negligence part because you have not asked those critical questions that you need to ask from the beginning. So I think the conversations that need to happen at the beginning, it's very important to ensure that you define the type of work that you're going to do. And in case anything is left out of scope, then it is not your mistake. The bank cannot sue you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dogo. I'm going to ask um, Baba Chopi one question, and then I'll, I'll probably one more to Chrissy, then I'll open it up to the to the um, audience to ask questions. Uh, Baba Chopi, have you had any success in capping your liability in Nigeria with the banks that you deal with? Yes. So in, interestingly, we have, and um, I, won't, I won't mention names, uh, yeah. but um, we've had the situations where, you know, it's always good to ask. You know, at the at the back of everything is the fact that did you have, did you just sign on an SLA without you know um, having it go through your compliance, right? 
So it's good enough that we are having the word global, right? And um, one of the things we see is that, um, you know, companies are equally st structuring their businesses in such a way that conforms to um, best practices. So um, if a lawyer drafts an agreement, drafts an agreement and, you know, for you to append your signature on it, and such agreements are not favorable, it's expected of, you know, of the legal person internally to equally point out those clauses with, within uh, the documents that are not favorable to you. So um, I, I think when we understand these as a contract, you know, it helps us have it more in a better, pers uh, in a better perspective, right? Um, everybody on the table wants something that suits them, right? Um, and sometimes what we even think suits us is against us, you know? I kind of afflog the fact that um, you think having that clause in your SLA or in your terms of business that you are signing with the client uh, puts them at an edge. No, it doesn't. So I, I think at the back of our discussion here at the webinar is the fact that we have clauses within our agreements that often keeps the valuer, you know, open to um, all sort of, um, you know, indemnifying the client to, uh, to an extent that is not defined, you know, which, you know, nobody goes into a contract with that at this age and time. You know, um, so you, you don't want to get into a business when you when your risk is not measured. We are all exposed. You know, the, the, the valuer is exposed. The bank is equally exposed, you know, and and I, I'm, I'm campaigning this. I'm saying it right that the bank don't stand to gain when or a client doesn't stand to gain when they think that clause that says um, if anything ever goes wrong, you would be liable for the total, you know, of what that is. How sure are you that the individual you are about to sue is worth the value of your loss, right? So in such a situation, it is common, it's, it's logical to say that let's both, let's jointly agree together, agree on the cap, then shift this body to an insurance person. The insurance people, you know, companies do their presentation over, you know, from time to time when they renew their policies and they do their presentation to establish how strong, what their processes are, you know, to justify this. Their proposals format, their terms of business and things like that. So we have had successes, right, in getting this done. And um, we, would, we have equally had situations where, you know, we have, we, you know, we refuse to sign, right? And we are still in discussion on how to get that done. So these are, you know, um, experiences of, daily experiences of evaluation. In the course of doing the job, and my my final submission here, you know, is that let's take discussion of our capital, right, as serious as we negotiate our commercial terms, right. I mean the fees. So when the banks or when clients see that um, I'm negotiating my fee, I need to equally negotiate my capital. You know, that makes the it makes this the space you know interesting for all of us. You know, and I, I see that as a future, you know, um, because one of the one of the challenges also is lack of judicial precedence. You know, you often don't want, you don't see people who want to take people to court or report them. And so in such a situation, when you, you know, there are lack of this information within local markets, it could be a problem to say, oh, you know, how do we establish when a duty of care is breached, you know, in a situation. So, um, I expect to see more instances where um, valuers are put on their spot to, you know, to commit themselves to the duty of care that they owe their clients, you know, based on skills and their, you know, and their personal knowledge in, in the course of doing their job, you know, and by so doing, we would have better practice, we would deepen professionalism within the practice, and, you know, it becomes a win-win for both parties. Um, I think that's 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 one of the things we, you know that I think the bank can help us with by ensuring that we have the opportunity to discuss our liability capital as much as they give us the opportunity to negotiate around the fees. Thank you very much, Topi. <clears throat> um, I have a question from the chat the chat room, um, and this is from Harry Morton. It says, "What does a valuer do when a client or lender refuses to accept liability?" And, and I'll open this up to whoever wants to answer it. <laughs> Judy, I mean, from my point of view, I think it's, I think it's all the things that the discussion has just covered. So um, 
we would see the three things that we've just talked about as being very closely linked. The scope of the work, what you will do and what you won't do, and in what time scale, mm. the fees that you're charging and the liability that you're agreeing to take on mm. as being linked. And so I think if a, if a client is resistant, I think it is having that commercial discussion, isn't it, about how a refusal to accept a liability cap might affect those other two parts of that sort of three parts um, commercial decision about what kind of risk you're prepared to take on as a business. And I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a very easy thing for me to say, a very difficult thing to say in, in practice, but you're never obligated to take on work. It has to be the right commercial decision for your firm with the risks that you're taking on, the reward that you're accepting to, to decide whether that's something that, that is sustainable for your firm, I think. But obviously I see it from, from a very different perspective being outside. It'd be interesting to, to see what, what you, Stephen and, and Tope think. Thank you, useful feedback though. Does anyone else have a comment on that? Well, where there's no contract, there's nothing to hold anybody for. So when you don't have a contract executed, either as an SAD or as a terms of business, um, you are not bound by um, such um, clauses that are, you know, that doesn't stand to favor the value. So, um, so back to the question, if a value, if a client refuses to, you know, agree to a liability capping, um, and it persists, it decides to still give you the instruction. You know, you do that at, at your own terms of business that it will sign on. You know, and that becomes a binding agreement between the parties, really. So I I I, I agree with what Kristen has said, and um, I would you know just to add that to you know what she has said what she has said about it. Okay. Um, I would like to open up uh, questions to the audience. Do we have any questions in the chat room? Okay, I have one from Simon. And he says, among the factors while setting the liability cap is level of fees. Imagine a customer whose property is estimated at $100 million dollars. Because this is a repeat customer, you discount fees to $10,000. The purpose of valuation is secured lending. Would you set the liability cap based on the fees or the market value or otherwise? Very good question, Simon. Anybody is free to take that one. So basically, are you setting your, your liability cap based on the fees or on the value that you have attached to the, um, to the property? So it's logical to set your liability capping with your with the value of the property because at the end of the day, when things go wrong, it is a percentage. Your cover, you know, the common practice we have in the market is that um, your the, the, your policy, the limit of your policy, is what people put forward as their maximum cap. So if you have a cover of a um, hundred million dollars, and just as an example, right? So that becomes your uh, maximum capping on that transaction, right? So it's not so much of, it is not, so um, your, 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 your liability, if you have to get a policy for it, then you get that at a cost, which you may want to factor in into your professional fees, right? So if it will cost me, um, a, a piece in, in our industry, right? PI covers, you know, could vary from 0 0.8 to 1%, depending on the business you do. So if, um, the cost of securing that policy is, um, you know, is high there. It is expected that such reflects in your fee, you know. So we are not trying to say fees and, you know, your, your liability cappings are related, but it is expected that that should reflect, you know, the risk you are taking because you are going to be, at the end of the day, people, another problem is people don't really understand what the fee is all about, your commercial terms. The fee you put on your valuation is, is to reflect the risk that you are taking as a valuer, you know, not in terms of what you pay as a premium or as a consideration to have that cover, but rather to say that if I will go ahead to tell you that this is what your property is worth, therefore, you know, this should be my fee in this direction. You know, um, there is a common practice in most markets where um, professional fees are based are done on scales. So there is a scale based, there's a scale of fees, 
for um, for 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 valuation stone, you know, and all I think all these are related, and that is why you know at the beginning I had said that let us have the same discussion as we discuss our commercial things to equally discuss our liability capping, but to you know to put the question in a very very to put my answers in a very straight perspective, you don't need to um, in, you know scientifically say this is my liability capping, then this is my this is my fee for it. No, it's, it's on the basis of the risks that you're exposed to, not on the basis of your fee. Thank you, Toby. Any other comments on that or responses or opinions? Yes, Judy, uh, I think it's good to, to make it very clear that the fact that uh, it's a revaluation or you have been involved before does not make the risk lesser. I, I think that, that, that's, that's very key that we, we make that distinction. And therefore, whether repeat job or not, uh, you must price the risk. And at the point of free discussion, you must have a full view of the risk involved, whether repeat job or not. So the fee that valuers charge for instructions looks after the time that we put in, uh, the risk that we onboard, um, and, 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 and it's not as simple as it may sound, it's a repeat job, and therefore charge me less. So, the, 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 the risk must inform the fee. And now recently, and the discussion we're having, the cap that the client is willing to agree to should also inform the fee because it, it, it's, it's an ingredient in the risk assessment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the, the next question is, must we accept a valuation assignment where the client, okay, we've answered that one already. Uh, okay, that's been answered. Then there's another one from Simon, and he's saying, um, I do understand that PI is an agreement between the valuer and the insurance company. In case of negligence on the part of the valuer, can a financial institution have direct recourse to the insurance company? Mr. Singh, I think that's straight to you. <laughs> yeah, so I think the obligation definitely that uh, if you're taking up a contract, do have the PI to cover your risks or your negligible or errors and omission. And therefore, the financial institution definitely will have a recourse. If, if you're sued, they can actually ask the insurance company to prioritize the, uh, the payment to them. They can either lien in the contract and say that um, if anything happens in that particular case, they are the ones who are to benefit. Or alternatively, they can ask the, the valuer to actually lien the banks so that when the event occurs, they're the first party to pay. So yes, uh, the bank has a way to sort of, uh, get paid in case errors and Thanks, Dogo. And I think the next one, well, anybody can answer really. If a valuer values the wrong property, then the customer defaults on loan payment, what would you advise the bank to do? This is from Percy. Well, I can take that. I think, <laughs> yeah, so if the valuer values the wrong property. Uh, those are errors and omissions. And I don't know if it's actually negligence also, because um, you have the care, the duty of care to ensure that you understand the instructions, you understand your work, and you do it properly. So when, when you go and value uh, the wrong property, the mistake is actually of the valuer and uh, the PI will kick in. You have to actually whichever time. Thank you. Then um, the next one is from Kirk. Does having the liability capping clause in limiting conditions or general principles section help protect the valuer, even if it is not stated in the SLA? Chrissy, perhaps that might. I would be, uh, I mean, I think certainly in England and Wales, courts will expect you to have very clearly brought any liability cap to your client's attention as part of contracting. So as part of your engagement letter, as part of your terms of engagement, I think trying to put it anywhere else, yeah. I would be very surprised if a court would allow that to be enforceable. I agree. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there is another question, quite a good one. I agree with Stephen's contribution. My experience is that most banks do not have 
staff competent enough to understand the whole real estate property valuation. This is the reason why they are always advancing scope that is outside what a valuer is able to do. Okay, I think that was just a comment. Uh, there's another one for a repeat client. I think so. Okay, that's also. Um, how is it like that's been answered as well? Yeah, so I think that's that's all the questions that we have so far. If we have any more questions, can we? Judith, there's a question uh, to the panelist, uh, which is asking how is the liability cap calculated? Is it a percentage of the value of the property or are the factors play while assessing the liability cap? I think that's the one that you want to take that one, Stephen. I think Topi just dealt with that, but you can just take that one again. Sorry, it had been taken, but rather there are multiple ways of looking at how to cap liability. One is a multiple of the fee. Um, two, a percentage of the market value assessed. Um, and that one, you can agree on a fixed amount respective. Uh, it's a discussion. So it's a commercial negotiation, basically, yeah. is what you're trying to say. Okay. So we've just gone over the hour, um, and I feel we've done you know, quite a bit of justice to, to the topic of discussion that we had set before us today. And, and I'm really glad that we have. However, it is only the beginning of, of a conversation. And I think one that needs to continue so that we can get more comfort amongst ourselves, the financial institutions and, and the valuation fraternity so that we, it's not seen as a tug of war as to you know, the banks thinking, how much can we push for and, and valuers thinking, how much can we push back? But more of a, an agreement and a discussion to see what is the best outcome for you know one the both of us and two the market and and three the end user at the end of the day so i think it's a discussion that we're going to continue having as we you know we, we educate one and one another on what exactly the liability caps are for what they do and also in dialogue try and mitigate the risks that may give rise to the need for PI cover in the first place. So if we deal with a bigger picture um, and, and sort of sanitize the whole valuation process and our service delivery and, and, and everything else that goes before attaching that value to that report, then we might find that you know, we, we, we having less contention around levels of, of PI insurance cover, liability capping, whether it's acceptable or not, to what extent, and, and things like that. So I'm really grateful to my panelists for one, accepting to be on the panel and two, doing justice to, to a, a topic which is not particularly easy to circumvent, but I think we've all done a fantastic job and I want to thank you very, very much. To the audience, you've been excellent, really interactive quietly, but in the chat, in the chat room, there's a lot of comments that have come out, a lot of questions that have come out. And I can assure you that Night Frank Africa will continue to put on webinars of this nature whereby we encourage interaction and, and dialogue and conversation around um, various principles and issues that we find are uh, uh, pertinent to the growth and development of our profession. Thank you very much, everybody. I wish you a good rest of the day and thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you, Judy. Bye. Thank you, Judy. Bye. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. Bye.